Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Audit and Finance Standing Committee meeting for Wednesday, October 20th. Uh, I'm Paul Russell, the Councillor for District uh, 15, Lower Sackville, and the Chair of this committee. I'd like to call the meeting to order. It is 10.01 a.m. As is standard with these uh, virtual meetings, and uh, this is there's a high potential that this is the last virtual meeting we will have of the Audit and Finance Standing Committee meeting. Um, but as a standard with these with these meetings, I'd like to run through the, uh, the councillors and, and uh, um, a few other key people and just make sure that uh, we have an audio video check uh, to make sure that everybody's connected properly. So let's start with District 1, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. <laughs> Chair and colleagues. It's a great day to have maybe our last final virtual Audit and Finance Committee meeting. Hopefully, I agree. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hensby, District 2, good morning. Uh, good morning there, Mr. Chair and colleagues, for today's quick meeting. <laughs> I'm hoping. Yep. Thank you. Councillor Purdy, District 4, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, colleagues. Everyone else, great to be here. It is. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cleary, District 9, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, looking forward to this meeting. Super. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Morris, District 10, good morning. Good morning, good morning all. Good morning. I don't see the mayor with us this morning. Uh, so Karen Brown, our legal department, uh, good morning. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. Okay. And others will uh, make themselves known as we go through the meeting, I have no doubt. Um, the approval of the minutes, uh, the next item of, of the uh, order of business is the approval of the minutes of September 15th, 2021. Can I have a motion Second. for Councillor Daigle Gammon? Seconded. Seconded by Councillor Hensby. Thank you very much. Are there any errors or omissions for those minutes? Hearing none, all in favor of the minutes of September 15th, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Great, thank you. Next is the approval of the order of business and approval of additions and deletions over to the clerk. Do we have anything? Thank you, Chair. Um, the clerk's office did not receive any requests for additions or deletions. Okay, thank you very much. So could I have a mover and a seconder for the order of business, please? I'll move. Thank you, Councillor Purdy. Thank I'll you, Councillor Morse. And are there any uh, changes requested by the committee? Hearing none, all in favor of the order of business, please signify. Aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Great, thank you. Business arising out of the minutes is none. Call for declaration of conflicts of interest. Okay, and not seeing any. Motions of reconsideration is none. Motions of rescission is none. Consideration of deferred business is none. Uh, uh, notices of tabled matters is none. Correspondence, petitions, and deletions, uh, sorry, delegations, um, over to the clerk. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the clerk's office did not receive any correspondence for this meeting, nor notification of any petitions. Great, thank you very much. And to the committee members, do you have any petitions? Okay, thank you. And we don't have any presentations this morning. We have no information items. Uh, we have no report from the Auditor General. And so we are on to the investment activities for the quarter ended June 30th, 2021. There is no presentation for this report. It is simply a report uh, from Renee Towns, who is with us. Uh, Renee is the Director of Revenue and the Treasurer. Um, and so I'm wondering if we could have a mover and a seconder for, uh, for this item, and this would be to forward this report to council. So I'll move, Mr. Chairman, that the Audit and Finance Standing Committee forward the report to Hell Actually to Council as an information item at the investment activities quarter ending June 30th, 2021. Thank you, okay. Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Hensby and Councillor Daigle Gammon. Um, are there any questions for 
uh, Renee Towns. If so, please signify uh, in the chat in Zoom. And I don't see any, uh, oh, uh, Councillor Morris, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just um, a question mostly out of curiosity. Um, wh why don't we have any bond investments at this moment? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Uh, thank you for the question. Renee Towns, uh, Director of Revenue and Treasurer, through you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor. Uh, so staff uh, actively uh, investigate opportunities in all sectors. Right now, we've not found any, any bond uh, offerings that were, were attractive to us. We continue to look at those and, and make our investment decisions based on where we can get the best rates. So we will continue to, to look for those and, and absolutely um, they are permitted under the investment policy. So uh, again, staff will continue to, to research those and to, to take advantage of those as market conditions uh, prove favorable. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I don't see any other questions. So I'm curious, in, in the report, you indicate that we're switching from the Mercer survey to the uh, RBC survey. And I'm wondering, uh, how those compare and will we be able to do a historical analysis, um, I guess over years, so that we'd be able to compare apples to apples or, or see something? Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for the question through you uh, uh, to the Council. Um, so Mercer discontinued its survey. So that was the reason that we switched to the RBC survey. They are very comparable. So just uh, money market rates and uh, rates of, of instruments that are similar. Um, so I'm not sure as far as a historical comparison would be. It's not like the Mercer uh, survey is available to be compared. So when it was discontinued, we switched to the, the, mo the survey that was the most comparable. Okay, so would we be able to get the historical results from the RBC survey over, over a number of years, or would we be uh, starting fresh from, from now? Uh, we can, uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, to you, uh, we can uh, certainly look in and see what historicals are available, if that is, uh, if that is your wish. Okay, uh, thank you. You also, uh, there is a note in the report that uh, external management uh, fees were not included in some of the comparisons. I'm wondering if they, those amount to any material, any material amount. Uh, thank you for the question. The portfolio is completely managed internally, so there are no external fees to report. Um, so that note is in our report, uh, just as, as a reference for when we are displaying the, um, the RBC survey results. Those results would include an external fee. So we're saying our results, um, we do not have, and we do not incur that additional fee. So it, it's it's even more beneficial to HRM because we are not paying an external consultant. So we're still beating the survey and we're not paying fees out to an external consultant. Okay. Super. Thank you very much. I have nothing further. And again, I don't see anything further in the committee. Um, so all in favor of the report, Councillor Cleary, go ahead. No, I was just anticipating the vote. Ah, there we go. All in, all in favor of forwarding the report to uh, Council, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Great, thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda uh, is the 12.2.2, the award for NFRP 21164, the Halifax Commons Aquatic Project. Once again, there is no uh, presentation for this, although we do have Darren Young and John McPherson from uh, Corporate and Customer Services um, available to speak. And so would uh, someone like to put the motion on the floor? I see Councillor Cleary, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd be happy to put this uh, on the floor. Uh, I move that the Audit and Finance Standing Committee recommend that Regional Council, one, approve uh, an unbudgeted withdrawal in the amount of uh, $1,538,135, that HST included, from the General Contingency Reserve, Q421, and two, increase the 2021-2022 capital project number um, CB210020, Halifax Common Pool Reconstruction, uh, fund by $1,538,135 net HST, and three, award NRFP21164, 
Halifax Commons Aquatic Project to the highest scoring proponent meeting specifications, Marco Construction Limited, at a cost of $18,134,293 net HST included with funding from project account number CB210020, Halifax Common Pool Reconstruction and project account number CB190008, Energy Efficiency Initiative as outlined in the financial section of this report. Second. Thank you, Councillor Morse. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Cleary. So I'm sure we'll have more to say about this uh, when it goes to uh, Council, but uh, this master planning process for the Common, uh, I believe it was 2017 when it began in earnest, and um, you know, massive consultation with the community uh, pre-COVID, and uh, most of that uh, happened uh, pre-COVID. And one of the big things is, of course, not only the need to update many parts of the common, but the aquatic facility in particular, uh, as councillors are probably aware, um, we didn't really get to use the pool uh, much for the last couple of years because of the problems with the existing outdoor pool. And the vision that uh, the master planning process has for the aquatics uh, area include the new pavilion or change rooms, offices, space, that sort of thing, the new uh, pool, which is going to have, it's a larger pool with a, a beach type grade that you can walk in, it's accessible, uh, the, the splash pad area. Um, all of these things are really, really important to providing these services and enhancing the common as part of the master planning process. So, um, you know, happy to see that, that you know, costs aren't terribly uh, inflated and, and things are still relatively on track. Uh, and this is going to be an absolutely fantastic facility uh, for everyone in HRM and beyond, for that matter, um, when when completed. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, colleagues. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor Cleary. Uh, Councillor Daigle-Gammon, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a question on the report, just on the discussion section, where there were four um, responses to the call for proposal. The report doesn't say who the vendor is going to be. And I'm just wondering, is that because we're waiting for this report to go through? Um, so I'm just curious uh, who was a successful vendor. Uh, we also have Denise Schofield, the executive director of Parks and Rec on the call with us. So I'm wondering if, uh, if Denise or Darren or John could respond to that, please. Certainly, Mr. Chair, I, I can jump on. The, actually, Councillor, the, uh, the third um, recommendation outlines that it would, the successful proponent was uh, the, that's being recommended is Marco Construction. How did I miss that? Read through the report and missed that in the motion. So because sorry. Because there's a lot of reports on your desk. That's how. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Does that address your concerns? Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Hensby, go ahead. Uh, thank you much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when this report comes back to Council, will we see some of the uh, uh, conceptual designs of this thing again? Um, you know, an $18 million aquatic project is quite a dip in the pool, I guess you could say, uh, for, for a project on the commons. Um, and I'm also curious, is, is this has to be site specific if we have major infrastructure issues underneath with the uh, fresh brook uh, um, culverts and, uh, and, the, and the storm sewer systems you know could we just not relocate the project and avoid all that underground uh, obstructions I'm just kind of curious if was that considered as, as an alternative in regards to placing it is where is as is uh, with the conditions under, underneath. And once again, I would look to staff for a response. Uh, Denise or Darren? Darren, do you, I, want, to, uh, do you want to start yeah. that? Yeah, thanks. Uh, Darren Young, Acting Director of Facility Design Construction. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the member. Uh, first for the questions around the infrastructure. So we, as part of the value engineering process, we, we actually relocated the building, negotiated with the, the proponent, and we've now situated the building and the pool in between all the infrastructure pieces. So we're not needing to go in and, and uh, disturb any of those pieces of Hello Box Waters uh, underground services. So we've already dealt with that piece as part of the negotiation portion of the, of the RFP. 
and uh, around the renderings, because it's an RFP process, there is no renderings or that. There's some very high level sketches in that, uh, as you can uh, appreciate the cost involved in doing these um, proposals, there's not a lot of detail put in and at that level till, until after the award. And then, so we can have something in probably the late fall area to go back to council with some early renderings of what the what we feel the site will look like and the building layouts and, and those kind of things. Well, my experience, we always had a conceptual plan or, or some kind of design shown to us. And especially if we're reconfiguring the, uh, the features on, on, the, on the site to avoid broke infrastructure, uh, then, you know, I, I thought there would be at least something like a schematic drawing of some sort for us to get a better, deeper appreciation uh, for this, uh, for this uh, aquatic project. So it just, uh, it seems like here we're going to award it and then, then we're going to see what, what we get after the fact. So it's, you know, sort of like, sort of like opening up an empty birthday gift. It says, so here's the wrap box. You open it up. It's not there. Oh, your, your birthday's not till, you know, We'll get it. It's it's a, a pending delivery, I guess you could say. And I'm just kind of curious of, you know, I, I like to see something to before we uh, commit eighteen million dollars on on a on a what I call an imagine imaginary pool. I want to see I want to see a, a project plan. Okay, we actually we have a site sketch that does outline where the building will position and where the pool and other infrastructure pieces will be. But there's a lot, like there's no detail level of in there, like how the building walls and all that. So we do have a high level site sketch, I'll call it, that we could present to, to council. I would like to know in regards to the original concept of where we thought it might go and with the uh, Fresh Brook um, infrastructure underneath, it's kind of changed our orientation on the site, you know, I'd like to have that information available so be be greater appreciation for the $18 million. So. Yeah, so we would have the originals uh, presentation that was part of the Commons uh, master planning process and we can provide that in the in the current sketch and you can see the, uh, the changes in, in what proposed uh, usage of spaces. Okay, that'd be great, thanks. That, okay, you're welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Councillor Cleary, I see your hand up. Uh, if you would like to close or, or speak later on, we still have a number of people who uh, would be speaking for the first time. Uh, I just, wanted to, uh, just uh, on that question, though, uh, and I won't come back. Um, okay. There have been a number of renderings. Uh, so if and those might, might not be the final designs, I'll let Darren speak to those. But I mean, their their um, council has seen, I think it was on Shape Your City Halifax. We did have, uh, and for the consultations with the public, uh, so, you know, if people want to see kind of what the facility might kind of look like, the bigger vision of what the pool is and that kind of stuff, there are drawings that, you know, people could look at and site plan, I'm sure, will come later. So anyway, it is there for people to see. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, Councillor Morris. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a few uh, short questions. Um, just if someone could confirm that this is a seasonal uh, recreation facility, like a three to four month uh, facility, if someone could explain to me what a universal shower is, please. And um, I'm not entirely clear on the soil issues. Um, if, if, if someone could just explain a little bit about why there's, I know there's contamination in the soil, but why would that be a health concern uh, if it's grassed over or if it's paved, you know, what, what would the concern be there? Please. Uh, thank and you all. Go ahead, I, I can answer two of those, and Denise could probably, if you don't mind, answering the one to the seasonal piece. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the member, uh, I'll speak first to the contaminated soils. So we will be disturbing those soils today. We'll be removing them. So that's why that would be the concern. It, it would be different, as you said, if we left it, it's capped soil, we wouldn't touch it. But because this is areas that we'll have to disturb to build the pool, build the foundations, remove the existing pool, all that, those, those areas, as we disturb them, we'll have to deal with those contaminated soils as per the provincial regulations. So you uh, universal. About, sorry, is it dust Go blowing ahead. around? Is that the, con the concern? Uh, no, just the regulation state. Once it's disturbed, it has to be dealt with under a certain under a certain process. So that's what it is. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, as for the universal change room, what it means is that uh, typical in, a, in an aquatic center in the past, we would have change rooms inside 
say a female change room and a male change room and only females would use those ones and males would use the other ones. These are going to be common rooms that you'd go in, you'd have a, what they call a dry space to get undressed. Uh, and then redress for the pool. And then so you know, maybe you've used it as you come out the door, I'm going back in that room, but it's a closed room with the door, ventilation lights and all that, total private, total secure space. But who's in that room next could be anybody. And so that's why I call them universal. Hmm. Okay. And Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor in terms of uh, seasonal. So yes, councillor, this is as an outdoor pool, our, it's, it would be the same as our other outdoor pools, um, just it's summer usage. Slightly different change that will happen with this new asset is uh, with the, the splash pad being outside the fenced area of the pool, with our weather, weather changing, some, we're able to keep some of our splash pads open a bit longer than our pools. Our pools are very tied to our, our lifeguard season. Um, so that it is it is just a seasonal asset. But uh, as Councillor Cleary very eloquently said, it's, uh, it's a will be a significant improvement over the current asset and has been a long time coming. Great, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Purdy. Thanks, Mr. Chair. My question was uh, along the lines of, uh, of Councillor Hen's piece as well, just about the, the concept, the, the plan. I wanted to know the difference in the footprint um, size of the new pool complex compared to the one that's already there. And if there's any more green space that would be eliminated with this new project, and if so, how much Through you, Mr. Chair, to the member, you, uh, I could speak to that. Uh, I don't have exact figures, and we can bring this back as part of the uh, information that we're going to bring back on the sky, a site sketch and that. But um, we will be disturbing some new green space. Some of it is existing, other hardscaping like a, a basketball court or a partial basketball court that's going to be coming out. But the areas where the existing uh, commons pool is and the pavilion building, those will become back to green space as part of the process as well. So it, there, there's probably a net negative, I'm going to say, of less green space because we are growing the footprint. It's a larger pool. It's going to have probably the three sections versus the pool today only has one. Pavilion building is growing some because it's going to have proper change facilities and some additional vendor space, some uh, covered uh, uh, areas so people can get out of the direct sunlight, things like that. So we'll probably be in the net uh, negative on the green space, but we can try to, uh, again, as we finalize the plans, we'll have a better number. But from what's on the site sketch today, we can probably give you a percentage of land difference. Does that work? Absolutely, that's great. And I'm just looking on um, Shape Your City and I don't see, <laughs> that doesn't mean much, but I don't see where the sketch would be of the new potential plan for the new pool concept. Um, but Mr. Chair, what I, what I think, think I'd suggest, uh, as Councillor Cleary said, it was on Shape Your City when we were doing the consultation. This, the, the concept plans were included when we brought the report back to Council to get it authority to actually move to this step. Maybe what I will, will do is we'll have that report recirculated to the members of the committee. The sketches were part, part of that so that you can, it's, it's been a while since that was uh, at committee, so, so that you can see those sketches. And as Darren said, he's got the, the concept sketch of how we've had to shift the site a little bit, but that uh, those original sketches, we can have those recirculated to you. Uh. Thank you, Denise. Uh, where this is recommended to come to council, if they could be forwarded to all of council instead of just the committee, I would appreciate that. Uh, Councillor Purdy, does that address uh, your concerns? It does, but so the vote today is moving this along to regional council for the for the final vote to to be able to move this forward. Is that correct? Yeah. It is that the audit and finance standing committee recommend that regional council. Perfect. No, that's great. It. it looks like it, it's, a, it's an exciting project. So that's great. Thank you. It does. Thank you. Um, Councillor Daigle Gammon, uh, would you mind assuming the chair for a few minutes? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great. Thank you very much. 
does that mean that you're on the list for a question? I, I have a couple of questions uh, and uh, yes, I've got a couple of questions. Thank you. And, and I am the last first speaker. Go for it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm gonna start off by, by commenting on the unsuitable soil. Um, one of the things that we have seen with a lot of the items is, is an, an unknown uh, risk of, of cost overruns uh, when we have unsuitable soil or, or contaminated soil. Uh, and I, I, I'm gonna start off by just wondering how nailed it down uh, the costs for that are. Uh, is there some allowance for overages uh, within just that piece of it? Because that could open up once you open the ground. Um, as I think everybody knows, uh, you don't know what you're going to get. The same way when you're doing a building renovation, when you open a wall, you have absolutely no idea what you're going to get. So I'm wondering if uh, somebody could comment on that. Uh, thank you again. I'll comment on that. So through you, Mr. Mrs. Chair, to the member. Um, I don't have the actual tender form or RFP form in front of me, which shows that breakdown of what additional um, um, contingency funds we've put aside on that. But I know we do have a general contingency fund. I do not cannot speak directly that we have a, a contingency fund for the unsuitables on their own. So I'll have to get that piece of information back to you or it could be part of this whole package that's coming back to council as a whole, uh, depending on what the member would prefer. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm looking at uh, Q421, the general contingency reserve. And this is probably a question, I do see Jerry Blackwood in the meeting, good. Uh, probably a question for, uh, for Jerry. Um, we have had a number of things draw down uh, Q421, and I was looking to see if I could get a, a history of uh, Q421 and why we're using that for so much and how over the past year, looking back at the uh, Q1 report, uh, we had $40 million in pending expenditures from Q421. And... Uh, Looking at the operating budget book for 21-22, it shows that that was dropping from 33 million down to 4 million. So we're planning on using it a lot. Um, I'm just wondering, was that was that planned for this year, um, or, or is that uh, something that is new to this? Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Russell, for that that question, and uh, I'll try not to. <laughs> Uh, confuse the the committee here too much with reserves as as uh, they are a bit of a, a moving target. So <clears throat> what we're uh, what you're sort of looking at is two things, and and uh, we'll we'll prepare a, a reconciliation uh, to take 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 you through that um, that we can do offline. So what you're looking at is estimated uh, budget uh, compared to actuals. So um, when, we, when we did the budget for 21-22, we were using the projected balance uh, as of December 31st, uh, uh, 2020. Um, the big piece of the 40 million in expenditures is a federal restart money, which, uh, which was part of this year's budget. Um, so that, that was coming out of the uh, general contingency reserve. The reason why um, we're using the reserve on this report, typically this, you know, this is a capital item and uh, we would go to uh, the capital reserve. But um, as you know, from yesterday's council session, we are in the process of preparing a capital budget. So we try not to do any sort of mid-year withdrawals out of the capital reserve while we're trying to balance that, that uh that budget because um, they are committed funding sources in there. Uh, this is, was was on plan and fits the business case for the, the general contingency reserve. Um, if you recall, we put, I think it was $11 million in that at, at year end to stock up that reserve. Uh, you know, that was anticipation of uh, inflationary costs around uh, COVID on, on uh, capital and, and operating items. And it's also a reserve we go to for any one-time expenditures or, 
or one-time grants that are uh, not budgeted for that are asked of uh, Halifax Regional Council. So I hope I hope that uh, kind of ties your question in in a little bit, and uh, we're, we'll certainly prepare uh, as chair of the committee um, uh, a bit of a reconciliation on 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 that reserve. That'll just sort of put it on paper for you a little bit that that you can follow it. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, my my concern is around the finances and around the the scope of this. It is uh, an eighteen million dollar project. Sorry, it was a seventeen and a bit million dollar project, and we're looking to add a million and a half to it already at the beginning of the project because the uh, the response came in um, to the RFP a million and a half over. And my concern is that uh, this is at the beginning of the project uh, that we are looking for this. And, and as with many of the projects, I would anticipate that it will be, that it will not be on schedule or on budget. Uh, so I am concerned that this will exceed the funds that we would be willing to allocate for it. Uh, and so I'm wondering if, uh, if one of the options in the report is a reduction in the scope of the project wondering what a reduction in the scope would look like and still be able to achieve many of the goals in the project. Uh, would that simply be uh, the removal of, uh, the, the pool sounds like a fantastic concept. Uh, being able to walk in as if it's a beach is, is phenomenal. Having it fully accessible is great. I'm wondering if, if uh, the removal of the splash pad uh, would constitute uh, the reduction in scope and would have that have the, um, the impact of recovering that million and a half expenditure and what would that do to any timelines? Wondering. So someone's going to take that question. I'm not. Uh, well, I don't have enough detail to break down the the components that we, we don't, we didn't get into that kind of like finite detail in the bid process. Um, so I, we have to go back to, to the proponent to say, you know, what, what cost associated to removing the splash pad. But as Denise alluded to earlier, the splash pad has become such a large piece of the after hours and late season process for our weather that that would be a feature that I think would be a very, very important feature to keep. Um, one other option if we do, there's potential to scope reduce some of the pool size, but um, keeping the ability to have lane swimming and the uh, ramp slash beach entry is such an important feature again, because of trying to be fully accessible and meet the 2030 deadlines for, for the Provincial Accessibility Act. So it, we would be challenged to go back. And I think we might be the point where our RP language will, now states that we may be over the percentages and, and can't negotiate with that proponent. So I'd have to go back to procurement and try to make sure that we're not having any issues on that side of it. So there's some potentials there on and how we do that scope reduction. So we would more be canceling going back out, which is gonna delay the project by a minimum one year. And as we already know, we're having challenges opening the, the commons pool that's there today. I don't believe it's open the last two seasons and next season, I, I don't, I don't have a status on that at this point, but uh, you know, obviously in, in, in question. So, I mean, the longer we go, that, that would be my concern with that. Mr. Kelm. Councilman <clears throat> Russell, are you, are you satisfied with that answer? I'm, I'm, I will come back later on. I've got to uh, uh, consider that one a little bit. Thank you, okay. Councillor Degelgammon. Would you like me to re reassume the chair at this point? I absolutely would. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we are now on the second list of speakers, uh, or the list of people who would be speaking a second time, and, and, and this is a far shorter list. Uh, Councillor Hensby, you had a couple of questions, so go ahead. Um, Mr. Chairman, yeah, I just chatted a couple, uh, a couple extra questions in the chat. You know, in regard to the seasonal aspect, I just kind of wondered, is there an opportunity if we had any solar panels on site that we could look at probably heating the water to extend the season? You know, open earlier in the spring and later in the fall, 
uh, with uh, solar, solar ambient to heat up water. And the other question I had in regards to the pavilion, um, every year we're always setting up a stage for, for concerts and events and stuff. Will the new pavilion have a permanent performance stage? So therefore we eliminate that uh, annual cost of setting up uh, staging. And also to let you know, I found the archive reports and stuff and those in the chat as well. The, 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 the Shape City um, portal as well as the uh, council report of 2019 that originally approved this. So, Councillor, uh, I'll I'll take a step. Those three uh, three years, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor. See, uh, the season for us is is the challenge is more about our lifeguards. So our lifeguards tend to be students, uh, university students who go back to school, and there is no solar panels planned in this particular project. That would add an additional cost. Not to say that we couldn't look at them in the future. What we had looked at for extending the seasonality was more the splash pad area. So that's that piece. In terms of the uh, pavilion building. We are finally finalizing the common plan now. I believe it's coming to be Friday. Um, and that's one of the components is, is to determine exactly what the, the pavilion stage, or sorry, what the pavilion components are. There is a stage at the oval pavilion that doesn't get used as that often. And that's one of the areas that we do want to start to increase our programming at that location. But we, we are exploring whether or not there should be a, an additional stage at the pavilion building as well. So I don't have a definitive answer right now, but I will have more information once I get that document on Friday. So that'll be something that we can answer uh, when it, this comes to council. Thank you. Thank you. And just to be clear, this is uh, targeted to come to council next Tuesday. Uh, Denise? Uh, you're on mute. Sorry, sorry Mr. Chair. Uh, this, I, I'd have to defer to the clerk on that. The, uh, the once clerk, okay. It's over, once it's through the committee, the clerk's uh, schedule determines when reports will uh, will be at council. Okay. Thank you very much. Us, ideally, it would be nice if it could get there on Tuesday. The sooner the better. But uh, I, I I can't uh, I can't say what what else is in the uh, is in the the schedule. Well, if it's sink or swim. <laughs> Annie? Thank you, Chair. Uh, generally, there would be between uh, the, the passing of, of a report from audit and finance, uh, the turnaround time would usually be um, about a two week period in order for it to be to, like the, to know for certain at agenda review that the report was passed, that it will be ready for discussion um, at uh, regional council and to provide staff for time to prepare uh, for, for that presentation. So um, I, I cannot confirm that it would be happening at the next meeting of regional council, but I would definitely suggest that it would be unlikely. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Purdy, you had asked a question in the chat, and I'm just wondering if uh, uh, if you would like the floor for a minute. Uh, no, thank you very much. Councillor Hensby posted the original report there, so I'm I'm good. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, and and thank you for that, uh, Councillor Hensby. Councillor Cleary, would you like to close, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, um, I think it's already been said, uh, the most important thing I think in this is the timing. Um, we, for the last couple of years, have not been able to offer aquatics programming on the common uh, because of the issues with the pool. So uh, if we want to continue offering our residents the kind of services that they've been used to and deserve, this needs to move forward. And of course, as part of the master planning process, um, this is something that um, uh, folks from all over HRN have told us they want. And, you know, this is only the first step, uh, as Denise uh, intimated, um, you know, the other parts, the, the great lawn, as it's called, all of the different uh, facilities uh, and, and upgrades uh, to uh, green spaces and to moving uh, some of the, that programming around is super exciting. And I can't wait for that to come. But as far as the aquatics program goes, uh, you know, we've got something pretty special here for, uh, for our city, uh, for our region. So uh, I'm excited for this to get to council. Thank you very much. I 
don't see any further questions in the chat and I'm going to defer on anything that I was going to ask for right now. Um, so uh, with that, all in favor of uh, this motion and uh, this recommendation to council, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Great, thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is 12.2.3, the fire station and volunteer firefighter uh, paging system upgrades. With, for this, we have a number of uh, staff members who are able to uh, offer input. Um, and I'm wondering if someone could put the motion on the floor, please. I'll move that, Mr. Chairman, that the Audit and Finance Standing Committee recommend to reach the council. That one approved the unbudgeted withdrawal of the amount of $559,374 from the fleet and vehicle equipment repair Q531, the current uh, fiscal year, and two approve a budget increase of $559,374. Capital project uh, BT31 HRFE, a power and backhaul upgrade. And three, award alternative. Procurement number 21-1168 for the Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency Pager System Upgrade to Bell Mobility Radio for $559,324 net HST included plus operating costs to extend beyond the initial five-year term subject to the operational requirements as financial application sections report subject to terms and conditions that are acceptable to the municipality. Second. Thank you, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Hensby. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, is there, by, uh, by, by regards to this, um, my biggest question is in regards to a pager system is that we learned in the last uh, significant storm, it was the capacity of our... Uh, David, David, if I may, uh, your audio is breaking up. Um, is there a chance you could... Uh, do something to stabilize that a little bit. I don't think that turning off the video would help, but it might. Well, I unplugged my backup battery. Maybe it's the battery plug in that's doing it. Do I hear it sound any better? You sound a little better for now, yes. Well, I'm just kind of curious regards to the recent experience we had with, uh, with Hurricane Dorian and stuff, the loss of our communication systems with, uh, with the towers running out of power and stuff. So will this backhaul uh, upgrade uh, address those issues? We want to make sure if our... Uh, if our pagers and radios are going to be working, we got to make sure the network works. We also have uh, Chief Steubing. Uh, we have Dave Meldrum, uh, both with Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency. Uh, we have Stephen Nearing. Do we have Stephen Nearing? I don't see Stephen Nearing <coughs> on the line. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, it's uh, Deputy Chief Meldrum from FIRE here at the FIRE headquarters. FIRE Chief is present, as is Division Chief Nearing. And thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for considering this. This is very important to us from a risk management perspective. Um, you know, as we've been advised, we're at risk of equipment failure, which could jeopardize our ability to page fire stations and individual volunteer firefighters. So that's a big risk element to us. Also, uh, we are, however, happy to understand that there is a corresponding operating cost savings here so that in the first five years of post uh, infrastructure upgrades, we'll actually see a reduction in operating costs to the corporation in excess of 400,000. So in theory, I'm not a finance person, so forgive me. I won't get into present value and future value of the dollars, but in theory in year six, we should be in a position to break even uh, on this in, in my rough math. With respect to Councillor Hensby's question and thank you for it, yes, absolutely. This doesn't completely protect us from long-term power outages to our tower and transmission sites, Councillor. However, it does upgrade the battery backup, if you will. I'm a lay person in the field. There are experts here in the, in the virtual room. It does upgrade them uh, to a higher standard and a greater capacity. However, there is still a requirement and will still be a requirement for uh, people to get on site and fuel generators if power outages are long duration. Councillor Hensby. Um, just a curiosity, are those uh, transmission towers, are, are they our own property or are, are we uh, doubling up on somebody else's tower? 
co-location issues. The uh, tower infrastructure is owned by Bell. Bell, okay, so, okay, all right. Thank you. As a quick follow-up to that, do we have a uh, right of access to the grounds should we need it? I would assume that we do. Uh, Mr. Cherry, yeah, sorry, absolutely. Uh, it is Bell property. We've not had a real world access problem in the past. We are talking to the vendor about that very thing. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Morse. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if someone could tell me a little bit about how quickly the infrastructure can be replaced and what the uh, overlap will be between uh, the old system and the new system coming on stream. You care to speak to that? Or? I can, certainly. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Councillor Morse, for the question. Certainly, original conversations, we had talked about a longer phase in, you know, two to four years, but uh, subsequent conversations uh, lead us to believe the vendor can do this work in one fiscal year. So that's important, again, to us from a risk management perspective. Um, as they do the towers, there may be temporary interruptions that are planned and we can absolutely work around those. And there are multiple towers that can back each other up, uh, but there shouldn't be any long-term or significant interruption in our ability to page firefighters to emergencies. But there will be an overlap period, I assume, between, uh, between one going down and the other being ready to go. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. If I understand your question, there will be times where some of the 18 towers have been upgraded while others have not, but they'll still have interoperability. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Morris. Does that address uh, your questions? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I was just wondering about the decommissioning costs. I didn't see that in the scope of the report. Is that just assumed to be included in the overall um, ask of this report or is that a separate um, amount that would need to be budgeted in for that particular um, project to decommission the old for the new? Thank you, Councillor. Yes, absolutely. Decommissioning costs are not included in this in this proposal. Um, they're they're smaller, much smaller in scope, and we believe that we can cover them within existing budget next fiscal. Okay, great. Thanks, hey, Mr. Chair. Just to add a little more information for the committee's uh, information. Uh, certainly we have Paul Schaffelberg who's online, who is certainly uh, an expert in the area as well. This, just so council understands, this is more than just the radio towers and the battery backup systems. It's the infrastructure within the radio system ability to transmit itself, I believe. So when, and that is all at the end of life. So when I first came here, there was serious concerns about that infrastructure at the end of life to the point where Bell was not even willing to entertain a conversation about a long-term contract to maintain that infrastructure because it was at the end of life and difficult to replace. So we are eager to move forward with this strategy to replace that infrastructure in as short a period as possible to transition to the new technology. And just to kind of reiterate what was mentioned by the deputy uh, in year six, that would result in roughly, you know, just under $100,000 savings a year that's currently in our operating budget. So although there's an investment upfront of, you know, 500 and some odd thousand dollars, um, that money will be recruited at almost $100,000 a year. And then after that point would not be required because uh, currently it's in our operating budget at $100,000 a year. So. The return on investments, basically five years. And then after that, it's cost savings in the operational budget. It's in police's or dispatch's operational budget, but in an operational budget nonetheless. Maybe, Paul, if you don't mind, if you could correct anything that I said that was inaccurate would be 
I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks, Chief. Yes, um, Mr. Chair, to, through to you, to the rest of council. Um, absolutely. The, the whole idea and here Paul, is, if, is Paul, if you wouldn't mind, in, Paul, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Oh, my, my apologies. So, so Paul, sorry, Paul Schaffelberg, um with uh, PCIT, uh, GIS manager, and also longtime friend and supporter of Fire. And my former role is a business relationship manager. So, so here, uh, so so don't be confused by my title. It's 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 not entirely relevant to the conversation. Um, my my apologies for that. But uh, yeah, really, you know, the, the the whole idea here is that because the the existing backhaul or the way in which the actual transmitters actually communicate to the to the larger network is so antiquated you know we are paying uh, quite a premium if you will in terms of maintaining that those old old, old t1 lines um that they're doing that so by moving to the new sort of modern really it's, it's a similar same same technologies that our trunk robo mobile radio network um, um lives on um, as well as the you know the commercial uh, cellular uh, network um, fiber network um, that Bell runs, um, it, they're, they're just more efficient and it's cheaper from them to maintain, and and so hence the uh, the ongoing monthly cost savings to the operating budget. Thank you very much uh, for that information. I have a couple of questions myself before we move into a uh, uh, second round of questions uh, from people. Um, in September, we brought forth another motion uh, related to the intelligent uh, dispatching uh, and station alerting. And I'm wondering how this motion compares to the September motion, uh, why they were uh, not done at the same time effectively. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Yes, and uh, I appreciate uh, the committee seeing us two months in a row, that's not normal for fire. Station alerting was spoken about in September and it's separate and distinct uh, from this current item under consideration. Station alerting is a brand new initiative to introduce new equipment and new capabilities to our career staffed fire stations. Uh, and that new ability is all about getting those career firefighters out the door faster. Um, so the technology there is brand new, doesn't exist. Uh, this, however, is existing paging infrastructure, which is re required uh, in our stations to get audible alerts to the firefighters in those buildings and is absolutely required for our volunteer firefighters who are in their communities wearing a pager on their hip. And this is, uh, this is the, the stuff that drives those messages to those important people. So they are in proximity, but they're two very different things. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the, um, the report mentions that it's at the end of the serviceable life. I'm wondering uh, how often these systems are inspected and when was it deemed to be at the end of the serviceable life? Um, the next question that I'm going to ask, or if you would like to answer it at this point is how come this wasn't brought forward in the regular budget process? How come it's a, an offline item? Question about well, serviceable life. If you like, if you if it's uh, the pleasure of the committee, Mr. Chair, I'll speak and then invite Mr. Schaffelberg to speak uh, potentially. So first of all, with regard to uh, service life, and I understand that Bell Mobility technicians visit these sites annually to conduct preventative maintenance. I also understand that there's a service agreement and service uh, desk kind of operation in place for that. So uh, and perhaps. Paul can elaborate on that. This was brought now, and you'll see that an alternative exists to funnel this to uh, more conventional budget considerations. We believe the risk here is high. So, uh, you know, experts in the field, the vendor and experts in PCIT notified us of this considerable risk uh, to our ability to respond to emergencies. So given our perception of the higher risk to the municipality, we felt it was important to bring it forward as soon as possible. Uh, thereby, we're here today. And if it's your pleasure, I'll invite uh, Paul Schaffelberg perhaps to add his comment to, to my response. Thank you, Deputy Chief. Um, Mr. Chairman, through you to the rest of the council. Um, yeah, two things there on the support side. 
Um, you know, obviously we're here in 2021 talking about paging equipment, so it seems it seems odd, but um, so there is a sort of an inherent risk to the to the larger technology that you know we continue to to evolve and evaluate, and that really has has partially led to some of the challenges over the last few years and really coming to terms with you know what are the alternatives and 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 the critical nature of this, which we've confirmed is still in fact the the, the number one go to technology for this type of service. So. Um, there is a support and, and certainly Bell in, in taking our money every month operating does have a commitment to supporting this technology. Really the risk here and what we've tried to outline in the report is that despite their best efforts, if we don't do something with some of these underlying infrastructure, they may not be able to fix it. So it's even though they're, they're there to support us and, and you know we were paying for that support, it's not an unsupported service. Um, the risk in getting the components physically in, in the, into their warehouses in order to be able to do this in a timely manner is really what we're what we're trying to address. And by bringing certainly by, by modernizing the backhaul to their sort of their, their standard you know MPLS you know fiber optic network, then we you know we we are modernizing that critical component of it. Um, in terms of why it's coming now, you know, to the deputy chief's point, we did not want to wait. And we did have an option to wait and, and bring it forward into the next capital cycle. Um, we have, as to why it didn't come, you know, uh, in last year's, we've really done uh, as much due diligence, you know, a, a bunch of due diligence now with this vendor to really understand: Are these options, you know, what are our options? Can are there ways to avoid this? Is this is this, you know, 100% necessary? You know, because again, we recognize that it is it is a significant investment into a, a legacy system. Um, so we did not want to, to to take this investment lightly. Plus, we also really wanted we we spent a lot of time, you know, over the last six to 12 months, working with this vendor to also understand how we could sequence the work based on risk. So we recognizing that, you know, we're touching, you know, 18 sites as it talked about in the report, you know, we're not going to do those all in a day. So therefore, how do we actually come to, you know, develop a plan to hit the ground running, to hit those sites that are the most critical, the, the most in danger of failing um, as, in, in a logical fashion. Um, and also how do we prioritize those investments that will start returning those operating savings to us, because we, you know, to, as the chief and deputy chief have, have identified, you know, there are tangible cost savings to our operating budgets. You know, we wanted to figure out what are those components that are going to start returning those investments and get those front loaded into the project so that the organization can also in parallel to the risk mitigation also start to see some of that payback. So those were really um, the, the due diligence that we've done with this, with, with our vendor on this, so that we're, we're very confident that, in, and, and as the recommendation outlines, once we get into this, you know, you know, you know if, we, if, we're, if we're approved to proceed, we're, we're ready to hit the ground with the vendor. We don't have to go through a long protracted design process. We don't have to figure out sort of how would we solve this problem. Um, we wanted to make sure that we have a clear plan and uh, and we're ready to, to 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 deal with it. Okay, thank you. I am over time, so I'm going to uh, come back. Uh, but at this point, I'd like to hand the floor to Councillor Hensby. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. I apologize for this. I missed that. Uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon was on the list of first time speakers. Uh, Councillor Hensby, you would be coming back for a second time. So go ahead, Councillor Daigle Gammon, I apologize. Mm, thank you, Mr. Chair, no worries at all. Um, David, if your question is in the same stream, I, I don't mind, but okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go forward. So my question is, one of my questions was answered, which was why it didn't come through the normal uh, budgeting process. Um, so I, I understand that and I actually understand, you know, mitigating a significant risk. And so the importance of getting this in now, um, I understand that. My question would be a little bit about what is the impact um, to that fleet vehicle and equipment reserve? Uh, if I'm reading the report correctly, uh, then the balance in that reserve account goes down to 982,000. Um, and so is there, uh, is there a risk there that the fleet and vehicle equipment reserve then um, is, what, what is that impact to that in terms of what are the future needs there in terms of a capital? 
Would that be a question for deputy or that uh, the deputy chief would like to answer? Or would that be something that uh, Jerry Black would, would take? I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Oh, Just acknowledging okay. the CFO, I think, is is a great speaker. So, please proceed. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Through to Councillor Daigle Gammon. Yeah, it's, uh, it doesn't present a, uh, a big risk. That's not a well used, or sorry, I shouldn't say a well used reserve. It doesn't present any uh, risk to to that reserve. Um, it's not um, widely used. It's, it's a bit of, uh, I think, uh, a reserve to go to for uh, immediate equipment needs. And uh, this certainly meets the business case. Uh, as part of our financial review every year, when we need to, to look at reserves that are deficient uh, and need to top them up, we can, we can certainly look at this. But uh, as Mr. Schaffelberg and, and uh, Deputy Chief Meldrum have, have said, uh, the, these, uh, this re reserve withdrawal would provide uh, operating savings to uh, Halifax Regional Police in next year's operating budget. Thank you. Halifax Regional Police? Uh, yes, that, that's correct. The uh, uh, dispatch services fall under... Uh, um, regional police's uh, di dispatch services budget. I see. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Dago Gammon, does that address your concerns? It, it does. Thank you. I guess I'm just, I'm curious because, you know, yesterday in council, we we're talking about the uh, capital plans going forward. And so to, to see a reserve go to that level, I was just wondering what would be the future capital requests that are going to be coming uh, from Halifax Fire and whether or not we were going to be able to, to, to meet that demand. But thank you. I appreciate your answer. Mr. Chair, just maybe for a little bit more information for the committee to expand on uh, our CFO's comments uh, about IES and HRP. So the IES Governance Board, the Dispatch Governance Board, which uh, I sit on and the police chief sits on, supported this. So although it's kind of unique that fire is making the request for fire technology, the operational budget for that the savings would come out of is out of the HRP budget because they dispatch for us, but certainly they are aware of this and support this request. And, you know, that kind of, it also explains why we're moving forward with this strategy to tap into a reserve that has limited ability to be used, uh, uh, you know, as far as what can the reserve can be used for. And it's also consistent with the sooner we make the investment, the sooner we address, uh, address the risk, and the sooner we can start to harness those operational savings. So that's why this strategy was chosen. Uh, but we've been working on trying to address this risk for some time. And every time we go through a storm season, we're a little bit nervous about, you know, the state of our infrastructure and its reliability. So that's one of the reasons we're here asking for access to that reserve because the reserve has limited ability to be used. It can be used for this and it's supported not only by us, but by the governance board. And we'll, the sooner we fix the problem and move to this new strategy, the sooner we can harness those savings. Thank you. Uh, and again, Councillor Dago Gammon, does that address your concerns? It does, but if I may, um, I have one more question as a result of, of the answer, which is great. Um, the report itself doesn't, um, it, it, it says like the communication division of Halifax Police. Um, I think it's on page three of the report. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, I'm just wondering if we could add language into the report or, or make it a little bit more clear that the actual savings comes uh, with HRP as opposed to Halifax Regional Fire. Um, I think that distinction uh, is a very important one. Um, Chief Stooping, you're, you're muted. 
Yeah. I can see I, I could see your hands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were just trying to talk about, you know, uh, we don't certainly have any concerns about that. We're just trying to figure out the process to amend the report before it goes to council. But certainly we can provide that clarity in the report if that's helpful. Um, well, it, we'll I just think it just shows such a really nice thing. Between, I think it shows such a really nice link between Halifax Fire and uh, the Halifax Regional Police. Um, and so uh, I, I do think people would appreciate seeing the creativity, I guess, in using this reserve and, and how it impl impacts both in the operating uh, savings coming there. Thank you. Sure. Well, thank you, Councillor. Thanks for the recommendation. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Hensby. It's your turn now. Thanks again, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, there's 18 <coughs> transmission towers. I know quite a few of them in the rural areas. And I know that Bell uh, Canada right now is extending their fiber op network. So I assume that all these towers will be or, or, or already have, have fiber op connections and stuff. So I'm hoping that uh, with their rollout of more fiber op in rural areas, will they be backing up these systems or upgrading the system of these towers. And I'm trying to recall back in the, the early days of amalgamation, I think one of, the, one of the very first tender calls we had was for uh, the mobile trunk radio system and, and with the 911 system and having the pager system with Molarola. And the question back then was, you know, are we going to be locked into this type of technology or service provider? So that kind of question begs to be asked again. If we go down this road with uh, Bell Canada, are we locked into them as they're our only service provider uh, available, or would there be any opportunities for alternative service delivery? Uh, you know, it could be Eastlink or Starlink, whatever the case would be. I'm just kind of curious if, if, um, if we go down this road with Bell Canada, are we locked into it uh, lockstep from here on in, or, or is there any way to see if there's any other players in the game after five years? Mr. Schaffelberg, uh, Deputy Chief Meldrum, or I could answer that. <laughs> Go ahead, you're both unmuted. Um, yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, I invite Paul perhaps to answer this. He's uh, more technically uh, proficient than I am. Okay, thank you, Deputy Chief. Um, Mr. Um, Mr. Chair, through to, through to the councillor. Um, this agreement right now, we're, we're recommending for five years. Um, we're fairly confident, again, through the due diligence that we've done, that while we're we're encouraged by the investments that are being made in, in rural Nova Scotia, particularly rural HRM, um, by the by the, the telco providers, um, we recognize that you know we're, we're still, unfortunately, uh, a ways away from having a robust alternative technology, certainly in the, in the pure IP space. So uh, while this does provide, you know, there, I think their language is in there, you know, providing us options to potentially renew, um, you know, get, recognizing that paging is a service that will be required for a long time coming. Um, it does really just set us up for, for this five year period. Um, but, uh, you know, I know that, uh, you know, we continue um, as an organization in partnership with FIRE and, other, uh, and others to, to continue to reevaluate what the potential alternatives would be uh, in, in throughout HRM um, to ensure that, that we're uh, recognizing and taking advantage of technologies and, and alternatives as they, as they come online. Now, with all these repeaters okay. and stuff that are on these towers, um, I was kind of curious how I read the last line of the report before financial applications, to upgrade site power and primary backhaul facilities, will they be owned by us or are we just paying Bell to upgrade their systems? And just kind of get clarification because uh, I assume that our repeaters are on their towers. So we own our own repeaters, but the actual site power and primary facilities, backhaul facilities, will they be owned and operated by us or they are or, or they contract to the Bell and we're just getting it upgraded? Um, Assistant Chief uh, Nearing may be able to uh, respond to this as well, but my understanding, um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, through to, through you to the councillor, um, is that we are we are purchasing purchasing. We're we're in a sort of a, a co-ownership or uh, perspective with these, where they own some of the components, we own others. My understanding of this is is that that we are purchasing, um, you know, the battery backups, etc., for this. But but I don't know. Deputy Chief. Uh, 
Um, Stephen Uring, Division oh, Chief, uh, okay. Max Byer. Uh, to the chair, through to the councilor, that is correct. Uh, we, uh, Bell will own the majority of the infrastructure, uh, but we will share in the costs of the equipment that we uh, that we during the life of the contract. So, thank just you. Out of, so, out of curiosity, our past experience with Hurricane Dorian, when we when our tower generators ran out of fuel. Are we going to have access to those towers to make sure they get fuel, or is that going to be Bell Canada's responsibility? So uh, through the chair, uh, Mr. Councillor, uh, we continue to talk, obviously, to Bell. We have a uh, you know a good relationship with that vendor, and access to those towers has not been a past problem. Certainly in past, where you know in dire circumstances during widespread emergencies, our staff directly from Halifax Fire we're able to access those towers and to provide that support directly in support of that vendor. So we don't anticipate problems in that regard. I, I would also add for the committee, you know, we continue to be very interested in alternatives. Um, some may already know, many of our volunteers carry a, a mobile phone application called I Am Responding, and it has wonderful capabilities for our volunteers to help give them better situational awareness. However, much of our municipality, unfortunately, still doesn't have reliable or dependable cellular phone coverage. So this paging is critical in that regard. We, it's reliable across our region where there are uh, currently spots where cell phone coverage is not reliable for our purpose. Yep. Thank you very much uh, for that. I'm, I don't see any further speakers on the list, so I'm going to follow on. Uh, Councillor Hensby's line of questioning. I, I, I wasn't uh, thrilled with um, the implication of, of one of the answers that I got, and that is that we would be sharing some services with Bell Canada. Our uh, Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency and, and, and Policing Infrastructure, I would see as um, a significantly higher priority as far as maintaining service. Uh, and I'm, I'm just wondering if we are sharing um, any of our equipment or facilities or whatnot, would it be shared with, is there a risk of us losing uh, service or, or having degraded service um, because we would have to uh, uh, support or provide bandwidth or, or other capabilities to um, other services that were not uh, Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency or policing? Maybe it's a uh, misinterpretation on my part. I just wanted to make sure that if we're putting in this infrastructure that we have uh, first right of use and, and the priority uh, access to all of it. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I'll start first. Our understanding from FIRE is, especially with reference to paging, that system is exclusively used for the purpose of paging fire department assets, so fire stations and firefighters. And there is no other capacity demand on it. So we don't uh, have a risk in that regard. Uh, in addition, you know, this is a contracted service. So there are expectations and contractual obligations on behalf of the vendor to ensure that our service is delivered as we expect it. I would invite uh, Paul, if you wish to provide additional answer to the chair. Thank you, Deputy. Um, Mr. Chair, through you to you. Um, Yes, that is correct. I mean, this is a dedicated service that we are providing. Um, as, as the deputy pointed out, um, we are um, not unsurprisingly the only um, people still using pagers um, for the most part, especially, but specifically in this area, this is the reason why the cost is coming to us is because we are in fact, um, you know, the sole remaining um, provider. Some of this technology that we were using are in, in fact, the original backhaul we used to actually be shared with the original trunk mobile, mobile radio, um, the, the previous incarnation of trunk mobile radio. And one of the reasons why the pressure came on to um, Health Park Regional Fire to make this investment is because that was sort of the last um, other tenant on this backhaul. So as a result, you know, it is down to this serve service. Um, so we would have exclusive access. This is not being put into the same mix as, you know, in competition with, uh, you know, traditional or cellular or anything like that, which is why we're, uh, we're implementing new switches as opposed to uh, just uh, renting space on, on some of the other ones. So 
Okay. There would not be that risk. Okay, thank you. I have two further questions and then uh, we'll Mr. Call Chair, the if it, yes, you sir. don't mind, maybe I have some more information just to add to Paul Schaffelberg's comments about that infrastructure. Something else Council should realize is, as you know, there's certainly been a lot of uh, interest and in Councillor Dago Gammon will understand this probably more than anybody. But we do have relationships with other fire departments on our borders that rely on some of this infrastructure as well. So certainly, you know, it does not just affect us, it affects uh, neighboring departments that we have agreements with to, you know, provide services for them. So, uh, and, and we talk a lot about fire service, this is being a mission critical bulletproof solution to being able to notify our people when cell phone does not work, debate, the pagers always seem to work. So the fire services across Nova Scotia and really across Canada rely on paging technology, even though it's old, old technology that none of us carry pagers anymore. Fire departments continue to rely on it because it is bulletproof. The problem is the technology in this case that's sending out the page is at the end of its life. So the strategy to page is still very important and you know needed in the fire service. There is no other solution that can do that in areas where there's no cell phone coverage or typical radio coverage. And I think you know that all the community the committee members here have rightly identified that this does trickle into emergency management. So although we're here with fire service uh, needs, the reality is we're also responsible for emergency management. And during a storm, our firefighters typically are very involved in, you know, responding throughout the community from an emergency management perspective, as well as a fire service perspective. So there is, you know, kind of cross pollination in that world to be able to service communities uh, for outside of fire needs, just for emergency management needs or storm coverage or whatever. Uh, I just thought I would add that, that this affects more than just HRFE. It affects some of our neighboring departments. Absolutely, and I appreciate that. Um, one of my uh, questions was going to be around serviceable life. And the, um, I, I don't remember or I missed uh, when this was at the end of its serviceable life. And I'm wondering about uh, uh, the asset management uh, portion of things about uh, what other assets do we have on the books um, and what other assets might we have that are not on the books that are approaching at the end of their serviceable life. And, and do, we, uh, do we know when, uh, when that might be for everything that is going around? Because half of, the, half of EMO is responding to the current situation. The other half is preparing for and making sure that the infrastructure is good and everything else. Um, so I'm just wondering if, uh, if you'd be able to, uh, to respond to that. Paul could probably speak to the contract and the extension. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of technical components in there. I wonder if if Paul has, uh, you know, a response. He understands the contract with the vendor very well. Paul, are you uh, able to assist the chair with the question? Sure. Yeah. No. Uh, thank you, Deputy. Um, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, Really, again, we're we're signing up for the five years here. Um, you know, we are implementing technology. We've been we have received assurances from the vendor that the 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 the, the, the pieces of, of the puzzle that we're replacing here are well supported. They're not at end of life. There's been no indication that the you know the vendors their 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 downstream vendors are, are are ending any support for that. I mean, obviously, again, as five years now um, passes before we know it. Um, and we potentially enter into another five year. I mean, there are other components that we will, to your point, absolutely have to continue, um, you know, to, to monitor. I mean, you know, you know, you know, you know there's, there's Motorola components, there's lots of different vendors in, in the mix here. And at any given time, as we've seen with some of the existing gear, um, it could simply be that it's no longer profitable for those downstream vendors. So um, when it comes to, when it comes to the paging system specifically, um, we do continue to monitor that and and uh, and and uh, and work with our vendor on that. 
Um, I'm not sure that uh, you know. I don't want. I don't want to speak sort of in more broadly in terms of other potential risk areas. But you know, we certainly recognize that telecommunications is something that uh, we do need to be looking um, as far downstream as 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 the industry and, and as the the ecosystem will allow us to do it um, to ensure that we're not caught short in not being able to uh, you know get get pieces of gear in the marketplace. Thanks okay. for that, Paul. If you don't mind, Mr. Chair, just to add, it's a fairly broad reaching question. So we certainly wanna take an opportunity to help council understand some of the moving parts here outside of this particular need as it pertains to our radio system. So the trunk radio system that's used provincially, we believe is gonna be extended for five years. Um, but outside of that, there are things coming down the pipe that are near the end of life. So specifically for HRFE, you will see through the capital budget process requirement to replace all our portable radios that are at the end of life. And I think that's currently targeted for 24, 25 to, you know, close to $5 million to replace portable radio systems. Um, then outside of that, there is um, a desire across Canada through the federal government to implement uh, a 700 megahertz radio system, which has a lot more penetration than the current 800 megahertz system. We're not 100% sure what that looks like yet, which is why the province is looking to, my understanding, to extend the, the trunk radio system for five years but that stuff is going to be coming down the pipe and will dramatically change our technology and our capability to communicate with our firefighters in places where we currently can't, you know, underground parking garages. And in addition, as an example, and in addition to that, there is the enhanced 911, uh, what's it called again? Next, gen Next generation 911, which is technology coming down the pipe to allow 911 call taking centers to receive broadband and internet and video transmissions through 911 and send it directly to the first responders. So the question is very, very far reaching. The reality is technology is gonna radically change our world and even uh, our self-contained breathing apparatus, which is also in the capital budget, uh, will more than likely need to interface with all those technology changes. They're talking about heads up display and the ability to be able to see that information visu visually that is coming in through the 911 call taking center. So despite all those cool innovations, this technology, which is very, very basic is the absolute bulletproof notification system that we will require despite those changes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm obviously over time, uh, so Councillor Morse. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is a very um, instructive uh, conversation here and a lot of uh, elements have emerged that I don't think were in the report. I don't know whether this is permitted or not, but I, I think maybe some amendments to the report would benefit council so that we could get at some of the implications here for the broader emergency measures. Um, I, I mean, it wasn't, I, I just wonder if we can include a few more elements in the report to make some of this clearer to our council colleagues when this goes forward. Would you like Certainly. to see... Oh. Would you like to see changes in the report or, or is perhaps a briefing note or uh, some sort of uh, lunch and learn training session, that type of thing? Um, would that be more effective? I'm not sure, Mr. Chair, I'll take your advice. I, I feel like there were some elements um, that weren't included that would benefit uh, council when this goes forward, but I don't know what the best way is to include that because I, I don't know if it's proper <laughs> to change a report at this stage. Maybe we need an additional briefing note, I'm not sure. Uh, Mr. Chair, certainly we have notes here to add the information that was suggested by Councillor Dago Gammon, which I think is fairly low lying fruit to be able to include. A lot of the information that we talked about today was based on questions about 
you know, how this ties to other technology, but this is really a standalone need as far as replacing infrastructure at the end of its life to be able to page. Um, certainly, I would be open to things that you would like added that would be helpful for council, but I'm not too sure where to start and stop based on the complications of our conversations. Yes, well, I, I, if I could add then, I, it wasn't entirely clear to me that this is uh, the overlap with the police, for example. And it wasn't entirely clear to me that the equipment um, would be owned by Bell and cost shared by HRM. So if um, some items like that could be made a bit more explicit, that would be very helpful. So we've made those nope. notes, thank you. I think we can okay. look to add that. We'll work with Paul and our team and make sure police is aware of those changes, but certainly they are. They did come up at the last governance board meeting. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Daigle-Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I actually agree with Catherine uh, as well. One of the things that happens when we get these kinds of things, because everything is interconnected. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't know about a briefing note, but I actually think about thinking about the future technology and how fire services are going to be supported with technology it might be a really nice lunch and learn um, because then we'll have some foundational information when we read these reports. So uh, I would actually request a lunch and learn. I think that you know it will give us a really a, a nice scope about what the next three to five years look like. And then when we're reading these lovely reports, uh, we'll have a really good frame of reference. So thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Ch to the councillor, I think a lunch and learn is certainly something we could facilitate. We do have what we call uh, a roadmap that is addressed at trying to move our technology needs forward, largely as it pertains to council directions on emergency response time targets. But there is kind of cross pollination and overlap, uh, as you've seen in our conversation today. So I think the lunch and learn is something we can look at. Mm -hmm. um, but if it would be all right with the committee, we would suggest we do that and uh, as one item and then make these amendments to the report to keep this moving along as quickly as possible to address the critical risk that we're all very nervous about. Oh, absolutely. I had no intention to uh, not uh, go forward and approve this motion. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, and I appreciate the, uh, the parallel streams of uh, activity on that. Seeing no further questions, um, all those in favor of this motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Wonderful. That motion carries. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency, uh, Paul Schaffelberg. Uh, thank you. The next item on the agenda is the Grants Committee, and there is nothing from that. Uh, there is nothing from committee members. There are no motions. Um, the next item on the agenda is the approval of the in-camera minutes from September 15th, 2021. I would uh, make that motion if you like, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, so that would be the motion to approve the minutes. Um, do we have a seconder for that motion, please? So that the, the, that the in-camera in private minutes of September 15, 2021, the approval circulated. Thank you. I'll second, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Morse. And do we need to go in camera for that or is everybody okay with it? Everybody seems to be okay. So all in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Great, thank you. Uh, there are no added items to the agenda. Are there any notices of motion? Okay. Uh, the next item is public participation and there were no registered speakers for public participation by 4.30 p.m. on the uh, deadline of the business day before this meeting uh, yesterday. Uh, so we have no public participation at this point. The date of the next meeting is November 17th, 2021. That will very likely be in council chambers. And the next item is the adjournment. Could I have a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. 
Thank mm -hmm. you very much, Councillor Daigle Gem, and we stand adjourned. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Thank you.